السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيد أي your heart be at ease, O servant of mine I am your Mawla al Hussein. I am the stranger of Karbala, and you are a stranger in these moments. Whoever visits my resting place, I visit theirs, and if they were put in hellfire, my intercession would spare. Did you not visit me after every salah? Did you not cry for me and wail for me? Did you not call out Labbayka Ya Hussein? Did you not call out Labbayka Ya Hussein? You have a right upon me, O oh my servant, and here is where you will take it, so do not be scared. O oh Allah, I beseech you in the name of my mother Fatima and her broken ribs. Let the light of Ziyarat Ashura bring tranquility to the graves of your deceased. By contributing to the Husseini message, a recitation of Ziyarat Ashura will be in the name of your loved ones who have passed on. Let their names be mentioned by the grave of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. What final time? In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. All praise is due to Allah, master of all the worlds and peace and blessings be on all his prophets and especially the final prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. My respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. We continue in our discussion concerning the Shi'i concept of authority and leadership, and especially our discussion from last night where we had shown that across the schools of the religion of Islam, there are narrations which mention that there would be 12 successors to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, and that this particular narration comes in different forms but can be found within Sahih al-Bukhari, within Sahih Muslim, and within all the other Sahih works, or indeed works of Sunan, a person may find variations. But then naturally, a question arises that while we saw that the number 12 is mentioned, how about the names of these 12 Imams? In our discussion last night, we established that the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family had no problem talking about that these 12 would be from Quraysh, for example, or that these 12 will be rulers, or that these 12 will be around until the end of time. But then the question arose as to which 12? Different schools in the religion of Islam try to give their analysis of who these 12 are. We showed that some said there could even be more than 12. Why restricted to 12? Then there were others who decided to hazard a guess as to who these 12 would be. Some of them taking the order quite literally chronologically that they looked at after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the events of Saqifah which we'll come to in the forthcoming nights. They saw that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, Muawiyah, Yazid, Muawiyah bin Yazid, and so on and so forth. So they looked at a chronological order, which, in one way, when a word, person looks at the word Khalifa, they could imagine successor after successor. 
Although when you look at another meaning of the word Khalifa, it is the meaning that is to appoint. Irrespective, you find, therefore, people ask us the question that when you are 12 Shia, or you are a 12 Shia, prove it to me from my literature as a Sunni that I should follow your 12 Imams. The reality is the names of the 12 Imams are not mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Bukhari doesn't even want to mention Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam or narrate from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. So I don't think you are going to get all the Imam's names. Malik bin Anas certainly had reverence for Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Abu Hanifa had reverence for Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. But there were unfortunately some of these compilers of the hadith who did not find anything appropriate to narrate from the sixth of our imams, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. So Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam does not make it. In Sahih al-Bukhari, the names of the twelve are not there. In Sahih Muslim, the names of the twelve are not there. In Tirmidhi, the names of the twelve are not there. Nasa'i, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, none of these pieces of literature in the Sunni world list the names of the 12 Imams. Sometimes, therefore, someone puts out a challenge that I want to see the names of your Imams and the list of the 12 in my books. Only then I will believe. The reality is that your books are not a barometer for me when it comes to truth and falsehood. Yes, I may quote your books. I may, for example, use your books in a polemical discussion to highlight that I as a Shi'i, when I have a law on mut'a, you had that law clearly in your literature. When I as a Shi'i have a difference with the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they had differences with one another. When I as a Shi'i have a difference with your companions. Your companions very famously fought each other and didn't lose sleep about it at all. But when you tell me, show it to me within my literature, the reality is that your literature still hasn't made up its mind who to revere, who not to revere. Your literature has within it certain personalities who you show reverence for and others you don't. Your literature has a number of personalities who you praise, who I reject completely, but you find a method of praising them. Your literature narrates from people who are very happy to fight my imam. Your literature quotes from people who are known khawarij and haters of Ahlul Bayt. Therefore, am I subject to Sunni literature? That's why whenever someone tells you, prove to me when the Sunni asks the Shia, prove to me Imam from the Quran. Tafsir of who? Your tafsir or mine? If it's your tafsir, then your tafsir ended up in the hands of known Jamalis and Safinites and people who had hatred for Ali and fought Ali. So again, when you say, show me something, I can show you any ayah, but you will do the tafsir as you deem fit. If I... Have a tafsir of that ayah. According to my books, you do not take my books. But you will only take your literature. As if your literature, Bukhari and Muslim, and Tirmidhi and Nasa'i and Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah suddenly become the barometer of what we are to take and what we are not to take. Further than that, the Shia will always try their hardest to hope that everything that they believe in must be in the Sunni world. No, the Sunni world have their own direction for how leadership went. One minute they were caliphs, the next minute kings. The next minute, even if it's a drunkard king, you still have to obey him. Even if he's in charge of Hajj, it does not matter. He's still the ruler. Some of the Umayyads they agree with, some they hate. Some Abbasids they agree with, some they hate. But the reality for them is that the caliphal evolution did not mean that the person at the helm was always the most God-conscious or the most knowledgeable. There could be advisors to that person who were more God-conscious and more knowledgeable. But the person at the helm could easily be 
enjoying merrymaking and dancing and being with concubines all night long. For them, the reality was that apart from the first 30 years, the rest of this could easily fall in anyone's hands. And when we discuss Saqifa and how Umar ibn al-Khattab said that this was a slip and God protected, I don't think God protected when we go to Karbala and see what happened to the Ummah. But anyway, therefore, when I come back here and someone now comes to me and says, that's okay, you can't find the name of your 12 Imams in Sunni literature. Someone could easily come to me and say, Wallah, I found it in this Yanabi or this Fara'id or this Kenz. The reality is that all these, in some cases, are not even seen as authentic or verified by the Sunni school. And on the other hand, sometimes the lists of these Imams' names doesn't mean that the Sunni world takes them as the ones who are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather... The Sunni world will look at them as, yes, these are spiritual guides at most, but that doesn't contradict them taking the Khulafa from Saqifa to the Shuras and whatever other methods they developed for choosing a leader. Now, the Sunni will ask the Shia, that, okay, the number 12 is there in the literature. If you don't show it in my books, then show it to me during the life of your Imams. And I replied to this yesterday by saying, that's like me saying that the hadith which I quoted yesterday, that the Khalafa will last for the 30 years after, and it talks about the caliphs, show me in that period of the 30 years after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died, show me a hadith book which is from that time that authenticates this particular incident. They cannot. Why? Because they know that Umar banned the writing. They know, therefore, that the race for writing our history and our literature begun a oh, hundred years or so in the Sunni world after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa give or take a few years here and there. And therefore, when it comes to us, the Shia, we are not to be subjected to these types of arguments, number one. Number two, I as a Shi'i have my own evolution of literature. That first and foremost, irrespective of whether a book is written or no, my imams are already walking books of knowledge on the earth. That's the first and foremost. Yes, you had to go to Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmed bin Hanbal and somehow come to a crystallization that these are the only four schools of law. I don't know why these are the only four schools of law. Again, you don't have no hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying, and Nu'man and Malik and Muhammad and Ahmed, these are your four imams of fiqh. You know, today, the, the Sunni world are so proud, one by one, to say, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Maliki. On what basis? On what hadith? But you do do it. On what hadith is there your belief of following these four schools until later on, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab came to even question the legitimacy of imitation and so on and so forth. But irrespective of that, you continue to say you're Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali. Or some of you took Ash'ari or Maturidi or Tahawi and all these different creeds of random scholars. On what basis? Is it in your literature that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa named all of these? Did Rasulullah say one day Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i should be the imam of school of law? No. And you know the thousands of differences that exist between these four imams alone. So when you come to me as a Shi'i and you say to me, name, name me the imams of theology or the imams of fiqh that you follow in your hadith literature. Show me them. Show me where did Rasulullah... No, 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 brother. They are the protectors of the sunnah. Likewise, mine are the greatest protectors of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Shi'i evolution of our literature has to be understood by our Shi'a. And that's why, just for tonight, I change up things a little. Just for tonight. Tomorrow we go back to Saqifah and the mess of Saqifa. But just for tonight, our Shia also need to understand the evolution of our literature. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died, 
There are pieces of our literature which existed. There are some pieces of our literature which sadly went missing. But you can tell from the narrators that we had pieces of literature that were being used by the companions of the Imam. In some cases, we may have pieces of literature that are debatable in terms of their authenticity. Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali is an early work which is attested to by our scholars, but people question whether this is a pseudonym, whether the person even existed, and the authenticity completely of the book. And from the beginning we say a Shia, we don't as such have one book which is called Sahih Al. Kitab Sulaim is present early, but even I as a Shia sit there and I look at it and I don't say that I'm going to look at it as the Quran. I may take that which is corroborated by other evidences and I may reject that where it needs rejection. And then I could also see, for example, that there may be a kitab of Imam Ali alayhi salam. There may have been other access to the knowledge of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam with the usul al arbamiya There may have been people who have heard of as sahifa al-Sajjadiyya or Risalat al-Huquq. And yes, how many of these, the manuscripts, remains exactly the same? In that period of the lives of the Imams, there are some, the manuscript is exactly the same. There are some we've lost. There are some where there may have been additions. And it is for the muhaqqiq to come and look in that literature. Even in that period, we had scholars like Al-Barqi and Al-Safar who had their works, Al-Mahasin and Basair al-Darajat, which were works compiled during the lives of the last of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. These are scholars who lived in the lives of, uh, during the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. And in some cases you may find that they give you the number of the Imams and they may tell you about certain incidents related to the names of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam where we then ascertain from others living in their time. Of them, arguably, arguably of them, the most important in that period who lived, who was born during the life of the Imams was Sheikh Muhammad bin Yaqub al kulaini When a person asks me, tell me about Imamat and the 12 Imams. Do I need to go to the Sunni literature? Sunni literature may give me a broad understanding of incidents related to my concept of Imama. But I need to know my literature. Sheikh al kulaini was born 250 after Hijrah. That means we're still talking during the period of the lives of the Imams. While Bukhari and Muslim were born in and around that period and just before, all of them have something in common, Bukhari, Muslim, Kulaini. The discussion of 12 after the Prophet, peace be upon his family. But Bukhari and Muslim do not name the 12. Sheikh Al-Kulaini, within Al-Kafi, has discussions on the importance of Imam, the role of the Imam, the knowledge of the Imam, the names of the 12 Imams. If someone wants to come and tell you Sheikh al kulaini came afterwards, again, I tell them that Sheikh al kulaini was alive and kicking while Ibn Majah was alive. This Ibn Majah you see in front of me, my dear brothers and sisters. There, the Sunan of Ibn Majah. This Ibn Majah that we see in front of us, my dear brothers and sisters, when was he alive? 209? Until 273 after Hijrah. That means while Ibn Majah was alive, Sheikh al kulaini was 23 years of age. But Ibn Majah, our Sunni brothers and sisters, put him amongst the six Sahah. So for us, if you are able to ascertain an understanding of Islam from Ibn Majah or from others who were living in that time, then why can someone not ascertain an understanding of the religion of Islam and its precepts from someone living at the same time as them. 
When Ibn Majah dies, Sheikh al Kulaini is 23 years of age. Therefore, Sheikh al Kulaini is living at the time of all of these. Yes, Sheikh al Kulaini continued to live for, let's say, 50 years or so after this. But when I, as a Shi'i, want to understand Imamah, I want to look in Al Kafi first and foremost. Now, someone here says to me, Yeah, but Al Kafi, you know, um, there's so many ahadith in Al Kafi that are not um, Sahih. Firstly, something not being sahih does not mean it's not authentic. In the Shi'i history and our development, we have had different phases in terms of the way we viewed the Hadith literature. And I cannot deny that there may be still Shi'a until today who look at the four books, including Al-Kafi, and say that we can't question any of those Hadith. But we developed and developed. Alam al-Halli and others came along with gradings that there may be a Hadith that's sahih and a Hadith that's muwathaq a hadith that's Hassan, a hadith that's Da'if. But Alam al hilliyah's gradings, there may be scholars who come later on and look at these hadiths as well, and they want to give their understanding of the authenticity of these hadiths. Can I say everything in Al-Kafi is 100% perfect? No, it's not Sahih Al-Kafi. But Bahboudi, the scholar, certainly tried to look in Al-Kafi to give his grading. Alam al majlisi looked in Al-Kafi to give his grading. Others of the scholars of Ahlul Bayt in other works, for example, did not stop and rest on their laurels. Ayatollah al khoi being a prime example, Ayatollah Asim Muhsini being another, they didn't rest on their laurels and just say, I will accept what's been written in the past. No, I can analyze as well. But when I want to analyze the names of the 12 Imams, I will see it in my literature. That's enough for me because the Sunni worldview did not accept the first of those, does not mention the sixth of those as his master and who he follows. So why should I expect them to list the name of the 12? The same Sunni literature has no problem saying Muawiyah is the one who goes to heaven alongside Ali. So why do I expect them to have a list of 12? Of my Imam's names. When I look at Al Kafi, I see within Al Kafi something important. First and foremost, is that most of the Shia do not own a copy of Al Kafi. And this is somewhat of a negative on our part. That in some cases we have neglected our own literature. And this is a reminder to me and all of you. That we neglect our own literature and we are concerned with what's in Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Ahmed bin Hanbal's Musnad, Ahmed bin Hanbal's Fadail, Tafsir of Ibn Kathir, the Tariq, uh, for example, Ibn al Athir, Baladri, Tabari. We're ready to name all of these. Ask the Shi'i to name you the main texts in their works. Some may have never heard of some of the names that I mentioned tonight. And that's an embarrassment and a negative on our part. That we neglect our hadith traditions. I'm not going to say that everything in my hadith traditions is 100% correct. But a hadith being da'if doesn't mean I throw it away. A hadith being sahih doesn't mean it's the highest level that will ever exist. There is a need for us to open Al-Kafi. And to look at the chapters that discuss the Imams, the role of the Imams, the knowledge of the Imams, the position of the Imams, the names of the Imams. If I look, for example, here, my dear brothers and sisters, join me. I have this over here, selections from Al-Kafi, of Sheikh Al-Kulaini. Selected from the English translation, compiled and translated by World Organization for Islamic Services. Okay, volume 5 over here. And of course... I have the whole of this set from the World Organization, from Wolfis. But here I will pick from the selected parts of Al-Kafi traditions which are Sahih. Either Sahih according to Alam al-Majlisi or Sahih according to Bahboudi. At most I might have included one which is Hassan. But the majority I'm going to pick on Imama are Sahih. Come back. Selections from the book of Al Kafi, Sheikh Al Kulaini, compiled and translated by Wolfis. Chapter 5, selected from the English translation of 
for the book of divine proof volume one al usul part two world organization for islamic services tahran iran i didn't expect this one to be uh real trust me al kafi was gonna be iran was gonna be iraq all of you could see over here kitab al hujjah kitab al hujjah is the book in al kafi which discusses imama if you want to know more about imama my dear brothers and sisters you open your book from a man who lived in the time of the imams lived during the ghaybah of the imam died upon the major occultation and that is of course thiqatul islam al kulayni now when we come over here i look at one of the hadiths which is mentioned over here and we see that this hadith is sahih and i want us to open up hadith by hadith on the imam so we understand the position of our imams look over here this hadith from muhammad ibn yahya and who and ahmed ibn muhammad bin isa and muhammad bin khalid al-barqi of course we mentioned earlier al-barqi my dear brothers and sisters uh, the author of the mahasin and al-qasim bin muhammad al-jawhari and al-hussein bin abil ala qala Listen to what it says here. I said to Abu Abdullah, okay, says to Imam Sadr alayhi salam, what? Is obedience to the successors obligatory? He said, yes. They are those about whom Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, has said, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you. And they are those about whom Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, said, Indeed, your master is none other than Allah and his messenger and the believers who perform the prayer and pay zakat while they bow down in Rukur. Innama waliyukum hu waliyukum Allahu wa rasuluhu wa alladheena amanu wa alladheena yuqimuna salata wa yu'tuna zakata wa hum raki'oon. Notice here that there are two ayahs being used by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in this hadith which is sahih. Which two ayahs? 459, 555. When someone asks you, prove to me Imama in the Quran. Here we have who? Hussein bin Abi al-Ala. He's asking Abi Abdullah about al-awsiyah ta'atuhum muftarada. The successes. Is their obedience obligatory? Yes. And then Imam tells him two ayahs which you are to use. That when someone asks you, prove to me Imam from the Quran, firstly you say, from my tafsir or yours. If it's from yours, then every Tom, Dick and Harry came and give a tafsir depending on who they liked and who they respected. If it's from mine, Imam al-Sadiq says, that two ayahs, obey Allah, obey the Prophet and the leaders from amongst you. Your reading on Ulil Amr is up to you. You may say Ulil Amr are only four. You may say Ulil Amr is even a drunkard who you still have to obey because he's the leader of the Muslims. That's your reading. This is mine. My reading is that at 12, as you have in your books, and that the eye of the Quran says obedience to them is the same as obedience to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which is the same as obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also Imam mentions that the wilaya is here in the ayah of what? When Imam Ali alayhi salam gave away his ring in where? In salah. Now, again, come with me here. Let's look. So first we've seen in Al-Kafi that if you want to discuss Imama, first and foremost, my dear brothers and sisters, you have the proof of which ayahs were revealed discussing Imama. One talked about Allah, Rasul, Ulil Amr. The other, Waliyukum Allah, Rasul, Alladheena Amanu. There's always a third part of the obedience or the guardianship, which Imam al-Sadiq says is about the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and that their obedience is obligatory. Now come again, selections from Al-Kafi. Sheikh Al-Kulayni, selected from the English translation, compiled and translated by World Organization for Islamic Services. Again, the Book of Divine Proof, Volume 1, Al-Usul, Part 1, World Organization for Islamic Services, Tahran, Iran, when is it published? Let's just have a look over here, my dear brothers and sisters. You'll see that this selection over here, author office, publisher office, printed copies, 1000. And it was first edition, 1431, 2010. I come over here, my dear brothers and sisters, 
And again, I have this hadith, which is sahih. Look at it over here. A group of our associates from Ahmed bin Muhammad from who? From Ahmed bin Muhammad from Abdullah, of course, Ibn al-Hajjal. From who? From Ahmed bin Umar al-Halabi that Abu Basir said, we, my dear Shia brothers and sisters, have to be more aware of the names of the companions of the imams and those who preserved our teachings. Come back. I entered into the presence of Abu Abdullah Imam Salih and said to him, may I be made your ransom? I am going to ask you about a matter. Is there anyone here who can hear what I am saying? He said, Abu Abdullah drew back a curtain that was between his room and the other room and looked inside it. Then he said, oh, Abu Muhammad, ask whatever has occurred to you. He said, I said, may I be made your ransom? Your Shia are saying that the messenger of Allah taught Ali a door of knowledge which opens a thousand doors. He said, oh, Abu Muhammad, the messenger of Allah taught Imam Ali a thousand doors, each of which opens a thousand doors. He said, I said, by Allah, this is the knowledge. He said, he tapped his fingers on the floor for a while. Then he said, this is knowledge, but it is not the knowledge. He said, then he said, oh, Abu Muhammad, verily, the jami'a is in our possession. And what should teach them what the jami'a is? He said, I said, may I be made your ransom? What is the jami'a? He said, the sahifa scroll whose length is 70 cubits. According to the measure of the cubit of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his dictation of it was from his very mouth. And its writing is of Ali by his very hand. That means the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa the Imams have access to a sahifa written by Imam Ali from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone knows about the city of knowledge and Ali being its gate. Let's go back. In it is every permitted thing and forbidden thing, halal and haram. Everything which people need, even the mud for scratching someone. The mulqat for scratching someone. He touched me with his hand and said, do you allow me, Abu Muhammad? He said, I said, may I be made your ransom. Indeed, I am yours. Do whatever you want. He said, he pinched me with his hand and said, even the mud of this, it was as if he was angry. He said, I said, by Allah, this is knowledge. He said, indeed, it is the knowledge, but it is not the knowledge. Then he was silent for a moment and then said, and the jafr is in our position. And what should teach them? What is the jafr? He said, I said, what is the jafr? He said, a container made of hide. And in it is the knowledge of the prophets and the successors and the knowledge of the men of knowledge of Bani Israel who have passed away. Al-Muhammad, ah, not your random person who was a convert 20 years earlier, one who was tending camels, others who were burying their daughters alive, others who were drunkards, others who were adulterers. No, this is the light of Abraham and the knowledge that they inherit from even those who have come from the past. Come back. He said, I said, indeed, this is knowledge. He said, indeed, this is knowledge, but it's not knowledge. Then he was silent for a moment. Then he said, the Mus'haf of Fatima is in our possession. And what should teach them what is the Mus'haf of Fatima? He said, I said, what is the Mus'haf of Fatima? He said, it is a Mus'haf, a collection of written sheets bound between two boards. Not the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, just in case someone thinks the Mus'haf of Fatima is the Quran, not the Quran. Come back. In which is the like of three times the size of your Quran. Therefore, it's not the Quran. He said, I said, by Allah, this is knowledge. He said, it is knowledge, but it is not knowledge. Then he was silent for a moment. Then he said, in our possession is knowledge of what has happened and the knowledge of what will happen till the hour comes. He said, I said, may I be made your ransom by Allah. This is knowledge. He said, it is knowledge, but it's not knowledge. He said, I said, may I be made your ransom. Then what is knowledge? He said, that which happens during the night and during the day, one matter after another and one thing after another until the day of resurrection. Someone might turn around and say, how could they have knowledge of these things? If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the teacher and he gives it to Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Ali can't give it to his son. He can't teach his son. Your father couldn't teach you. So if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches Imam Ali alayhi salam about the knowledge of the unseen that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has from the heavens, Imam Ali cannot teach it to Imam Al-Hasan and then not to Imam Hussein, and then from there to Imam Zain al-Abidin, Imam Baqir, Imam Sadaq, come back with me. Selections from Al-Kabi, Sheryl Kulaini. Selections from English translation, combined translated by World Organization for Islamic Services, number eight. The Book of Divine Proof, World Organization for Islamic Services, Tahran, Iran. When was this printed, my dear brothers and sisters? Same selection, first edition, 2010, 1431. Wolf is Tahran, World Organization for Islamic Service, Tahran. PO Box 1155, Tahran. Again, another hadith over here. 
a Sahih Hadith concerning the fact that the Imams are muhaddathun and are made to understand perfectly. Muhaddath is different from muhaddith. Fatha kasra. Muhaddith, let's say someone who's involved in the world of narrating hadiths, knows the world of the sciences of hadith, has a depth in understanding hadith. Muhaddath are those who the angels can communicate to. Come over here. Of course, someone might turn around and say, the angels, how could they communicate to someone who's not a prophet? Ask Maryam alayhi salam. She'll give you more about that story. Come back. Ahmed bin Muhammad and Muhammad bin Yahya. From Muhammad bin Hassan, from Yaqub bin Yazid, that Muhammad bin Ismail said, I heard Abu al-Hassan alayhi salam. What did he say? The imams are men of knowledge, voracious, who are caused to understand perfectly and are muhaddathun al a'immatu ulama'un sadiquna mufahamuna muhaddathun. Is the hadith sahih? The hadith is sahih. All of you at home can go and check if I am choosing hadiths which are sahih or not. Again, we come here, my dear brothers and sisters. I wanted to show you something here which is very important. What is that? And that is that even within Al-Kafi, sometimes you have these sections over here. What are these sections, my dear brothers and sisters? And I want you to all get used to Al-Kafi. Here, I come to number nine. And when I come to number nine, the book of divine proof of Al-Kafi, yes, I see here that What's very interesting that we're about to come across is the proof and the signing of what? Look at the title. The sign and the warrant for Imam Ali's Imam. We all can see that. Imam Ali is the first Imam, correct? Then after the hadiths finish on this, they continue the sign and the warrant for Al-Hasan bin Ali. Then after this, they continue, my dear brothers and sisters, the sign and the warrant for al Hussein bin Ali, meaning the clearest hadith about the imam of each of these. Then after this, we come, my dear brothers and sisters, to who? To the sign and the warrant for Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam. Then after this, my dear brothers and sisters, the sign and the warrant for Abu Ja'far, Imam al-Baqir. Then the sign and the warrant for Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam. These are hadiths under each section about how the people knew who the Imam was of that time and who narrated it. After this, the sign and the warrant for Abu al-Hasan, Imam al-Kadham, alayhi salam. Then after this, my dear brothers and sisters, the sign and the warrant for who? For Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. In other words, al-Kafi for each Imam, one after the other, not just names them, but the proof of the hadith authentically of the sign and the warrant for them. Let me pick one which we can use. This is a sahih hadith, my dear brothers and sisters, or actually the grading is Hassan on this hadith, if I remember correctly. The sign and the warrant for Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. This hadith states what? Ali bin Ibrahim from his father, that Ismail. Of course, all of you know Ismail bin Mehran said when Abu Ja'far was going out from Medina to Baghdad in the first of his two journeys there. Imam al-Jawad was going from Medina to Baghdad, first of two journeys. I said to him as he left, may I be made your ransom. I fear for you in your setting out in this direction. To whom will the affair belong after you? He turned towards me laughing and said the concealment ghaibah is not as you imagine during this year. When he was taken away the second time to Al-Mu'tasim, I went where? I went to him and said to him, may I be made your ransom, you are leaving. So to whom will the affair come after you? He wept until his bed became wet. Then he turned to me and said, in this departure there should be fear. For me the affair belongs to my son Ali after me. So imams in each of these sections, what are they doing? They are giving you the hadith about the imam to come, the hadith, the signing, the warrant. When you give someone the warrant, it means you allow them to enter. Permission has been given for them to know who is the one after. So here each of these names, the imams, and who they're talking about to come after them. Then you see over here, my dear brothers and sisters, another of the hadiths, which is a sahih hadith. It's in which section? 
concerning the moment, this is very important, concerning the moment when the Imam will know that Imam has passed to him. Look at this hadith, my dear brothers and sisters. Muhammad bin Yahya from Muhammad bin Hussein Safwan said, I said to ar ridha alayhi salam, tell me when the Imam knows that he is an Imam. He says, when news reaches him that his master has died or when he actually dies. As when Abu al-Hasan the first passed away in Baghdad, you were here in Medina. Imam al-Kadhim died where? Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam died in Baghdad. Imam al-Radha alayhi salam was in Medina. How did Imam al-Radha alayhi salam know that he had become an Imam? Did he have to wait for the news? Let's see. He said he knows this when his master dies. By what means does he know? I said, Allah inspires him. Yulhimu. Here, look at the Arabic. He looked at him and he asked him, يَعْلَمُ ذَلِكَ حِينَ يَمْضِ صَاحِبُهُ قُلْتُ بِأَيِّ شَيْءٍ قَالَ يُلْهِمُهُ اللَّهِ Allah inspires him with the knowledge. Someone might say to me, Allah inspires your imam with knowledge? Yes. The same way Allah inspired the mother of Musa alayhi salam وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ نَرْضَعِي فَإِذَا خِبْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِ وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَادُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ The same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can inspire of the mother of Musa is not a prophet. Allah can inspire the imams of Ahlul Bayt. So here you see that Imam al-Radha in Al-Kafi, because sometimes people ask this question, that if an Imam is in one country and another Imam is in another, how would that Imam know he's the Imam? He says, Allah inspires us. And we know at that moment. And there are interesting ones concerning this in other sections. Another hadith, my dear brothers and sisters, about the Imam and his position, which is very important for all of us to understand. Look at this Sahih hadith. Where, number 13, come over here. A group of our co-sectarians from Ahmed bin Muhammad, of course, who you all have heard of from Al-Washa, from Tha'laba bin Maymun, from Abu Maryam said, Abu Ja'far, peace be upon him, said to Salama, who was, of course, the son of Kohel, and Hakam bin Utayba. Listen to what he says. Travel to the east and travel to the west. You shall not find any true knowledge except that which has come from us, the Ahlul Bayt. A person wants to go to the Sharq or a person wants to go where? Look at this. You want to go where? To the Sharq or the Gharb. فَلَا تَجِدَانِ عِلْمًا صَحِيحًا إِلَّا شَيْئًا خَرَجَ مِنْ عِنْدِنَا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Someone might still turn around to me and say, the Imams are inspired. There is no knowledge but from the imams. The imams are the students of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The imams know when they are imams. The imams sign of the warrant for the imams after them. But where are their 12 names? Come over here, all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. Al-Kafi by Al-Shaykh Abu Ja'far Muhammad bin Ya'qub bin Ishaq Al-Kulayni Al-Razi. Volume 1, Al-Usul, Part 3, 4, the, the Book of Divine Proof 2. Wofis, World Organization for Islamic Services, Tahran, Iran. I come over here, what do I see? Title Usul Al-Kafi. Because as you know, we have the Usul, we have the Furu, and we have the Rawdha. Volume 1, author Sheikh Al-Kulaini, translators Khalil Ja'far, publisher, World Organization for Islamic Services. Edition, first edition, 2007. Someone says, what am I going to find here about the names of the Imams? Will I find, come with me here. Look at this chapter, 126, everybody at home. The names of the Imams, can you all see? Chapter 126, what page? Page 439. Ma ja'a fil ithna nas alayhim alayhim salam. Chapter 126, what has come down to us in narrations concerning the 12 Imams and the evidence of their authority. Peace be upon them. This hadith is sahih. The chain, of course, is mentioned. You all know it. Ahmed bin Muhammad al-Barqi, Abu Hashim Dawood, al-Ja'fari, Abu Ja'far, the second, Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam, said one day, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, came forth and with him 
was his son Al Hassan bin Ali. Someone might say Imam Al Jawad said Imam Amir Al Mu'minin. We have the chain complete on the one hand, but on the other hand, our Imams, what the first of them says, the middle, the last of them, every single one of them, their words are perfect, their words are the same. One narrates from the other in a golden chain. And that we could go further into depth in understanding when Imam al Jawad says, Imam Ali says, we can go further on another occasion. One day, Amir al Mumin alayhi salam came forth, and with him was his son, Al Hassan alayhi salam. And he, Imam Ali, was leaning on the hands of Salman. He entered the sacred mosque in Mecca and sat down when a man of pleasing appearance and dress approached. He greeted Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam who replied his greeting. Then he sat down and said, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, I will ask you about three issues. If you inform me regarding them, then I will know that the people acted irresponsibly in your matter regarding the leadership after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi And it is all over for them. They are neither safe in this life, in the, this life of the world, and nor in the hereafter. And if it is otherwise, and you cannot answer me, then I will know that you and they are alike. So here we have someone quite mysterious, who seems to have a long life. And as we know, Allah could cause shaitan to have a long life. So there could be prophets who have long lives. There could be others who could have long lives. And he meets Imam Ali alayhi salam, and he begins to tell him, "I'm going to ask you three questions. You answer them. I'll know the people truly." were irresponsible the way they behaved with you in relation to your leadership. And if you don't, then I will know that you and they are alike. Amir al mumin peace be upon him, said to him, ask me whatever you wish. He said, tell me about the man who sleeps. Where does his spirit go? And about the man, how does he remember and forget? And about the man, how does his children resemble his paternal and maternal uncles? Amir al mumin alayhi salam turned to Al-Hasan and said, oh Abu Muhammad, answer him. Imam Al-Hasan Seemingly quite young at the time, Al Hassan answered him. So the man began saying, I testify that there is no God besides Allah, and I continue to testify that. And then, and I testify that Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and I continue to testify that is the Messenger of Allah. And I testify that you, Ali, are the testimony, trustee of the Messenger of Allah and the upholder of the divine message with his authority. And he pointed to Amir al Mu'min. And I continue to testify that I testify that you are his Amir al Mu'min, testimony, trustee, and the one upholding the divine message by his authority. And he pointed to Imam al Hassan. And I testify that Al Hussein bin Ali is the testimony, trustee. Of his brother and the upholder of the divine message by his authority after him. I testify regarding Ali ibn al-Hussein that he is the upholder of al-Hussein's affairs after him. I testify regarding Muhammad bin Ali that he is the upholder of Ali ibn al-Hussein's affairs after him. I testify regarding Ja'far bin Muhammad that he is the upholder of the affairs of Muhammad. I testify Musa that he is the upholder of the affairs of Ja'far bin Muhammad. I testify regarding Ali ibn Musa that he is the upholder of the affairs of Musa ibn Ja'far. I testify regarding Muhammad bin Ali that he is the upholder of the affairs of Ali ibn Musa. I testify regarding Ali ibn Muhammad that he is the upholder of the affairs of Muhammad bin Ali. I testify regarding Al Hassan bin Ali that he is the upholder of the affairs of Ali bin Muhammad. And I testify regarding a man from the children of Al Hassan al Askari who will not be mentioned by his epithet nor by his name until his affair becomes manifest and he fills the earth with justice as it will have been filled with injustice. And peace and blessings be upon you, O Amir al Mu'mineen, and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. Then he, arose, then he rose and left. Amir al Mu'minin said to his son Al Hassan, O oh, Abu Muhammad, follow him and see where he goes. Al Hassan bin Ali, peace be upon him, went out and said, As soon as he put a foot out of the mosque, I could not figure out where in the earth of Allah he disappeared. So I returned to Amir al Mu'minin and informed him. He said, O oh, Abu Muhammad, did you recognize him? I said, Allah, his messenger, and Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, know best. He said, He is Al Khidr, peace be upon him. You asked me for the name of my 12 Imams? There are some who believe Khidr is still alive. Some differ. Some say Isa is still alive. Some said Idris. Some said others. Shaitan, Iblis is certainly still alive. Allah can prolong the life of some. And there are some who meet Amir al-Mu'min on one occasion in Shia literature. The dua of Kumail that we hear of was known as the dua of Khidr. Khidr manages to reach from Moses to prophets and so on and so forth. And he comes to Imam Ali and in this hadith of Al-Kafi, the 12 Imams, one by one, he testifies. For he knows that Ali is the container of the vessel of that knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which he taught to the Imam. Therefore, when someone asks me the name of the successors, 
I'll use Al Kafi comfortably to look at Imama, its position, its importance, the knowledge, the grandeur, and the names of each one of them. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank <laughs> you.